we were building this platform first for 120 of our classmates at Hopkins. It now has over 3 million registered learners all around the world. Welcome to the Business of Healthcare podcast from the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management at the Naveen Jindal School of Management. Here at the University of Texas at Dallas, we bring together business leaders and other forward thinkers to discuss how best to meet the challenges of a rapidly changing, increasingly complex healthcare ecosystem. I'm Dr. Bob Kaiser, Director of the Master's Program in Healthcare Leadership and Management. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting app to ensure you don't miss any of the future episodes. You can also join us online at businessofhealthcarepodcast.com. Today, we welcome to the Business of Healthcare podcast, Shiv Gaglani, co-founder and CEO of osmosis.org from Elsevier. We are delighted today to have you, Shiv. Let's start off today. I want to tell the audience today a little bit about who Osmosis is. I'm going to turn it over to you for your background. But my understanding that Osmosis is a medical and health sciences education technology company that empowers the world's clinicians and caregivers with the best learning experience possible. That, to me, is a compelling message. So welcome to the podcast, Shiv. Bob, thanks so much for having me. And I uh, really appreciate you taking the time yeah, briefly, my background, uh, I went to medical school at Johns Hopkins. Uh, I did two years of medical school. And during that time, uh, you know, was fully immersed in how we were training our future healthcare providers and realized at the time with my co-founder, Ryan, that uh, we were using pretty antiquated systems like 60-minute lectures, which weren't evidence-based um, or it's not how people should learn or wanted to learn, especially with the rise of short-form video content that we're all familiar with, like YouTube. And so Ryan and I were talking about how we could make learning medicine more fun, more engaging, and more effective using evidence-based techniques. And we decided to take time off, scare our parents in the process, and launch this health education platform that has grown beyond our wildest dreams. So to, to give you a context, we were building this platform first for 120 of our classmates at Hopkins. It now has over 3 million registered learners all around the world. Um, and so that's enough to fill up over 18,000 lecture halls at Hopkins uh, and fortunately, a year and a half ago, the really well-known, well-regarded publisher Elsevier, um, which has celebrated its 140th anniversary recently, acquired us. And with that, we've been able to scale what we've done to even more people, not just medical students, but also nursing, PA, practicing clinicians with our continuing medical education and also patients and family members. Wow. You mean to tell me that you dropped out? You sound like some of these other famous people that drop out <laughs> of college, like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. You dropped out of medical school to do something innovative and different. That must have taken a lot of insight. Go deeper on your background. What's, what was your upbringing like? Yeah, so I was born in Namibia. Uh, I was, uh, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa. My parents, uh, sort of, it's genetic, the interest in healthcare, because my dad's a retired physician. He ran a hospital there and then in South Africa for a couple of years. Um, my mom's a physical therapist and my sister's a dentist. So the, the joke is between the Gaglani family, they can treat anybody. I'm sort of the black sheep because I haven't yet finished medical school. But to clarify, I haven't, I'd actually never dropped out. I just took a leave and Hopkins was really helpful and nice. They gave me over 10 years of leave and now I'm going to go back later this year and finally, I think, make my mom proud and and, and <laughs> become a physician. But yeah, I grew up in uh, Africa first and then we moved to Florida near the Space Coast. Uh, so my area code is actually 321 for 321 liftoff. So I was growing up around a lot of engineers, a lot of really smart people and decided at an early age, uh, maybe like 10 or 11, I was really interested in combining healthcare with biomedical engineering and building medical devices. So that's where I studied in college, um, biomedical engineering with a minor in health policy, pre-med. And then I wound up actually doing an MBA between, uh, you know, uh, starting osmosis and then going back to med school. Um, and so I've always been very interested in scalable solutions. And one reason I like your podcast and what you do and stand for is scaling, you know, the business of healthcare is all about how do you scale things that work within healthcare uh, and provide the best quality to the most number of people through uh, improved access. 
Well, sounds to me like you and your organization is on a lifelong learning mission, which I think is is critical. And there's a lot of similarity between what you're doing. When I, I, I read up and learn about what you've been doing, and I go, wow, we're trying to do similar type things here at the University of Texas, Dallas. You know, we have an Alliance for Physician Leadership program that's 22 years old. It's got a long waiting list to get in. But we bring in physician leaders, and, and we try to bring them up to speed with the current issues and problems that you're doing through your education process as well. But I think you're doing a little bit different. Before we get into the details of that, today is a unique day. As this podcast will be released shortly, today is actually February the 28th, and it is Rare Disease Day. Tell our audience what that is and why it's a big deal. Yeah, so rare diseases are actually much more common than one would think. There's over 7,000 of them and counting more ones are being discovered uh, every every year. And collectively, they affect over 300 million patients directly and hundreds of millions of their family members indirectly uh, through the care that they need to provide. Some of these rare diseases you've heard of, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, phenylketonuria probably, many others you haven't heard of. And Osmosis has had collaborations for years with different rare disease patient advocacy groups because we believe in, uh, similar to Elsevier, making healthcare truly inclusive. And to do that, you have to, you know, be able to provide the best care to people who are even, you know, one of 10,000, one of 100,000, one of a million people who are affected by a condition. And the reason rare disease is important is not only for that individual and their family member, but also the, the research on rare diseases has led to uh, therapies and drugs that have affected hundreds of millions of other people. So a good example is the rare disease familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, which is high cholesterol in families. The research on that led to the development of statins. And obviously, many people take statins for just general cardiovascular health. And so at Elsevier, we've had this focus on rare diseases where we were building this rare disease healthcare hub with the largest library of osmosis style videos on rare diseases. We've made over 200 of them. They've seen, been seen over 35 million times already. We're launching a rare disease journal so that scientists and uh, even patients can submit articles about different rare diseases. Um, and we uh, at Osmosis have this newsletter that goes out every week. We hope, hope some of you listening will be interested in going to it. It's osmosis.org for slash zebra, where you can sign up and get a zebra of the week um, uh, rare disorder. And the reason it's called zebras, and you know, I know this is an audio only podcast, but you see, I have my zebra next to me. I'm wearing a zebra print, is because there's a saying in medical school, which I was taught literally a decade ago at Hopkins, which is when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses, not zebras, right? Think of the more common thing, not the rare thing. And so rare diseases are represented by zebras. Uh, and that's been a major focus. Uh, and in fact, at Elsevier, we're calling 2023 the year of the zebra. Uh, and the reason that matters now, and one last point on this, is that, um, the, there's a major piece of legislation that was signed in 1983 called the Orphan Drug Act. The Orphan Drug Act was uh, seminal because it incentivized life science and pharma companies to actually pay attention to these rare disorders um, because it, it, there's so few people re relatively who are affected by it that you had to incentivize them to with, through longer patent protection and tax incentives to actually do the research on rare diseases. In those 40 years, there have been over 800 uh, new orphan drug designations that have been developed, more than half of that in the last decade. So it's speeding up and accelerating that research. We see a future where in the next decade, not only will patients and their families get their diagnoses faster through the better education that we're able to provide uh, at Elsevier uh, and through other partnerships, but also will help develop more therapies, drug repurposing, new, new therapies. I know you've had David Fagenbaum on the podcast so we're very committed to making healthcare truly inclusive through this rare disease focus in the year of the zebra. So Elsevier, let's educate our listeners about Elsevier if they're not familiar with them and the journey that you went on to be acquired by them and following on to that, the year of the zebra with Elsevier. Yeah. So Elsevier has been around since 1880, uh, shortly after 1880. They're a really well-regarded publisher probably famous, most famous for the title Grey's Anatomy, obviously, which became famous through the TV show. So it's funny, my dad, who trained as a physician in India, used Grey's Anatomy, and the people who taught him used Elsevier resources because it's been around so long. And so we we made a partnership with them early on um, because they're so committed. They have this whole uh, commitment to improving and what we call raising line, training more healthcare providers, because we all know there's been a, there is a shortage. M many of your physician leaders know this. There's a shortage of doctors, shortage of nurses, 
So we're committed to training more of them. And then the ones that exist, continuing to improve their quality of their care through evidence-based medicine and lifelong learning, et cetera. So it was a natural fit when Elsevier, our partnership kind of transitioned into one where they acquired us. And the journey really was very standard startup journey where, you know, we left med school, started the company, raised a seed round for my business school professors, raised a series A from a, a really well-regarded West Coast investor called Felicis Ventures, which backed Canva and uh, Shopify and all these other name brand companies. Um, and then we were deciding whether to raise a series B or, or go keep going down that venture path when the Elsevier opportunity came up. And we found that, you know, what we often talk about, my uh, mentor at Elsevier, a um, guy named Jan Herzog talks about this concept of connecting the dots where one plus one equals three. Yeah. Uh, Clearly, that's been the case. We're a year and a half into Elsevier bringing osmosis on. And through, you know, just to give you an example, through their network, they have over 9,000 employees in uh, dozens of countries. I was in Portugal a couple of months ago, and their teammates in Portugal met up with me. We went to visit the Portuguese medical schools that use osmosis and are, will use osmosis. Um, and so they've helped us scale much more rapidly because our overall goal at osmosis is to educate a billion people by 2025. We want everyone who cares for somebody to learn by osmosis. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, over 3 million registered learners with over a quarter of billion views of our videos. And Elsevier just kind of jump started that because they translated all of our content into Spanish, just as an example over the past year. Uh, and they've done this playbook before. So we're really thrilled that not only are they helping us kind of reach more people and vice versa, but also taking ideas that we have like a long time collaboration with rare disease groups and turning that into the year of the zebra and then scaling that uh, beyond what we could do independently. So what is the year of the zebra? What is going to happen? Yeah. So the year of the zebra uh, officially launches today on rare disease awareness day, uh, which is the last day of February. So every four years, it's the rarest of days. It's February 29th, actually on a leap year. And then February 28th, obviously on, on the three other years. Um, and uh, we are releasing a weekly newsletter with a video of uh, an osmosis style video explaining a condition like Pierre Raban sequence. This was the one we released yesterday um, with a patient's story. And this is critical because a lot of these are just terms and scary diagnoses, uh, ICD-10 codes potentially. But when you include a patient story, a patient video, and many of our teammates at Elsevier Relics are directly affected by rare diseases, as an example. So, um, you know, it's very personal for us as a, as a mission. So we released this weekly newsletter that goes out to hundreds of thousands of, and soon hopefully millions of people. We're releasing this rare disease journal, which is going to be publishing open access uh, journal articles on rare diseases. And we have this healthcare hub, which we continue to add to the rare disease hub. Like Elsevier, during when COVID started, we created a COVID hub. There's a women's health hub. Um, so now there's a dedicated rare disease hub that, that basically we want a, a future where if a patient receives a diagnosis, they go and get the most trusted, accurate health information, which Elsevier is known for. They get in the most digestible, easy format, which osmosis is known for. And they get the best access to scientific research, which again, Elsevier has over a couple thousand journals. Uh, they get hundreds of thousands of papers published every year. Um, and so we're really looking forward to dedicating more resources to the year of the zebra. There's already talk of it becoming the decade of the zebra because the vision is over the next decade, you know, we're 40 years since the Orphan Drug Act. At the 50-year mark of the Orphan Drug Act, which is 2033, the hope is we have thousands of more therapies and treatments and cures for rare diseases. Uh, and people who have these rare diseases, their diagnostic odyssey goes from an average of four to nine years to hopefully half that time because there's more awareness. We're using AI to diagnose these people um, and find commonalities. There's no language barriers. or uh, And then we're also training the next generation of healthcare providers to spot these zebras better. Wow. You started this whole idea for a small group of classmates. Did you ever have in your wildest dreams the concept that it would expand to the level it is? Was there a point in time where you said, we're on to something? This has got jets. It's going to really launch. It's interesting. It's it's a bit of a roller coaster because, yeah, early on, we're like, yeah, there's jets here because all of our classmates loved it. We started hearing from their friends at other medical schools who wanted to use it. Um, and then we launched the mobile app. We went from 120 users to 5,000 during that launch. But then it was kind of slow and stagnated a bit. So it's very much like not always up and to the right. And so you have to sort of balance those out. To your first question about did we ever imagine uh, it would achieve this, there's a great quote uh, called Amara's Law, uh, where it's basically people tend to overestimate the impact of technology in one year and mm -hmm. underestimate its impact in 10 years. It's a hype cycle. Right. 
Right. Bill Gates Bill Gates paraphrased this and said people tend to overestimate what they can accomplish in one year and underestimate what they can accomplish in 10 simply because of the power of compounding, right? If you get 1% better every day, by the end of the year, you're 37 times better because of compounding, but day to day, it doesn't seem like much of a difference. So for us, certainly, like, you know, we we were very hyped in the beginning, and then there was a bit of a lull, and then we just kept kept at it. And another quote I like, which is, is if you stick around long enough, your timing is perfect. And so we just kept sticking around and and went through it. And then COVID happened, which was terrible, though obviously a lot of schools went online. They had to go online, remote learning. There's a lot of interest in training healthcare providers, there still is, uh, and osmosis sort of sits at the sweet spot of online learning, very engaging, best-in-class online learning with healthcare. And so, so that's kind of took off over the past several years. This story that you're sharing reminds me a little bit of Sal Khan from the Khan Academy. You know, he started to create learning, interactive learning, very simplified, easy to use interactive learning, I think it was for his uh, niece. And, you know, he's trying to tutor her. And then a few people heard about it and a few more people heard about it and it caught on. Talk a little bit about the learning environment, because I think that's pretty, pretty important. What osmosis does that's unique? What makes it look attractive? Why is it useful? And how do you address such a broad broad range of clinical and non-clinical people with it? Yeah, it's a really good question. So uh, side note for Sal connection, very astute observation. Um, you know, I've had Sal on the podcast and the reason we sort of grew in that in the shadows of, of Khan Academy and in a specific niche of healthcare, because uh, a lot of our team actually used to work at Khan Academy. And then, you know, Khan Academy had this bit, small healthcare team that wasn't that focused on training professionals or stu- medical students, but more like college students. And so our chief medical officer now, Rishi, ran that team. And then other teammates like Tanner Marshall, Kai Slynn, and, and uh, Hillary Acer have all come from Khan Academy. So we have that that kind of in our DNA. As far as what makes it effective, people want to consume engaging short form video content. We've seen that across the board. The most popular sites in the world are sites like YouTube, the number two traffic, most traffic site in the world, TikTok, Instagram. People like to learn visually and auditorily, and they want bite-sized chunks for micro-learning. And so we have developed you know, this massive library of over 2,000 videos that cover everything from basic physiology to pathophysiology to medical procedures. And I'm, as I mentioned, I'm going back to finish medical school. I'm using osmosis all the time to relearn, I just last week, electrocardiogram. Like I just learned all of that in instead of what I would be taught at a traditional med school, which is you know, 10 hours of EKG lectures, we took the best parts of it, made it super visual, added some jokes and some sound effects, and boom, you can do it in a tenth of the time. So a 60-minute lecture tends to be a six-minute video on osmosis. So we're saving a lot of time, and this has real ramifications, not only for the learning experience, but also you know, at places like University of Vermont, which is a client of ours, they went from a four-year medical school curriculum to a three-year curriculum. They took their preclinical didactic portion and turned it into one year. Osmosis was an important part of that because they eliminated lectures. They used osmosis to flip their classroom. And that has ramifications because the median debt of a graduating medical student right now is $200,000. Wow. Um, and if you and that's because it's four years, it takes so long. But if you can make that three years, boom, you save $50,000 right there for that student and hopefully give them less stress and less pressure to pay that back. So that's just one example. Other things we do, you know, we know at NYU, for example, one of our great partners, we know that the students in their third year of med school are seeing like, so say there's a student, Jane, she goes and sees a patient who has diabetes uh, or ketoacidosis as an example today. So tomorrow she's getting a push notification to her phone with a video from osmosis or a question from osmosis or Elsevier about diabetic ketoacidosis. So it's sort of, we call it educational retargeting. You're familiar with this because if you go look up something like you want to buy new pants on Google, you're getting ads on Instagram for pants like the next couple of days. We do that, but for education. So we we know a physician, a med student, a nursing student has learned about sickle cell anemia today. Tomorrow they're getting more content on it and we're spacing out that education so that is top of mind and and retargeting them. So those are just two examples of why osmosis is a bit more engaging, effective, more evidence-based. This episode is brought to you by the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, the definitive resource for healthcare management education in North Texas. The center is based in the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. It plays a unique role in training the next generation of healthcare leaders to meet local, regional, and national demands. 
The Jindal School uses its strengths in accounting, administration, finance, marketing, and information systems to educate highly qualified personnel for healthcare administration and executive leadership positions. The center is home to seven healthcare leadership and management programs, including undergraduate and graduate programs, as well as executive programs for physicians and working professionals. For more information, visit us online at jindal.utdallas.edu forward slash healthcare. So go beyond, go beyond the, um, the medical students, the, uh, the, the nurses, the PAs, the doctors. Um, what about operational, real-life doctors and others out in the real world? Are they taking advantage of osmosis? Yeah, so I mentioned 3 million registered learners, but on YouTube, we're the largest health education channel on YouTube. We've gotten over uh, 240 million YouTube views of our content, plus another tens of millions on osmosis, so over a quarter of a billion views. You look at the comments on these videos, and we invite you to, it's youtube.com forward slash osmosis, and there are practicing clinicians, there are students, there are patients, etc. We have tracked on osmosis over 200,000 registered practicing clinicians who've registered at some point. And we offer over 250 hours of continuing medical education. So we have some relationships with healthcare systems and others that provide osmosis content for continuing medical education to their providers. Obviously, this is one major part why we joined Elsevier is that, you know, they have thousands of relationships with health systems and hospitals and, you know, retail pharmacies, you know, CVS and Amazon and Walgreens, Walmart all around the world. And so because of that scale, they already have. We're sort of just plugging in osmosis content and boom, it's already able to reach all the people that they're able to reach with their best products, a clinical key as an example. That's largely a driver for why we joined Elsevier and and why it's been a match uh, made in heaven. Let's shift the conversation a little bit. Um, We've covered a broad range of topics here on osmosis, but I get this feeling that rare disease is one of your, your key personal interests and priorities. Am I correct in thinking that? It is, yeah. Tell me about a trip to Kilimanjaro that you recently did? Yeah. So we, um, you know, I mentioned I'm from, I was born in Africa. And uh, one of the reasons I didn't like learning in medical school, the the adage, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras, there's two reasons. One is obviously it seemed very dismissive of rare disease patients. And I got to start meeting them in medical school. And since working on this, um, people with cystic fibrosis, phenylketonuria and other diseases, they're so, generally you meet a rare disease patient or parent they're heroic. They often take what could what's a terrible diagnosis, oftentimes no cures, very little understanding, took them six years to be diagnosed, and they turn lemons into lemonade. They start patient groups that get people together. They find cures. I mentioned, you know, you know David Fagenbaum. You've had him on the podcast. He wrote a book, Chasing My Cure, about his own work, trying to cure his Castleman disease, which he did, and for other people. So they're very heroic stories. So I love that. But the second reason when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras, is that I was born in sub-Saharan Africa. Zebras are actually pretty common down there. So it didn't sit well with me. So part of the PR, like basically to capture people's attention to raise awareness for rare diseases and kick off the year of the zebra was I led a group uh, earlier this month uh, at the beginning of Rare Disease Awareness Month, which is February every year. Uh, and we went down to Tanzania and we climbed Kilimanjaro and I was wearing a, a zebra costume and, and we had a zebra flag. Um, <laughs> and the most meaningful part of that is two of the people on the trip either had a rare disease or potentially have one. So wonderful uh, people. Isabel is uh, somebody who climbed with us. She has hereditary angioedema. The only reason she's alive today is because uh, the Orphan Drug Act. And she was carrying her life-saving medication with her on Kilimanjaro, puts them in on her through an IV that she placed herself the night before our summit. So that's Isabel. Another woman, Charlotte, who's the daughter of actually one of our Elsevier teammates, Paul Kahn, uh, Charlotte's mother and grandmother have Huntington's disease, which is an autosomal dominant condition, terrible prognosis, no cure. Charlotte finds out in a couple of weeks whether she has it. So it was a very spiritual and meaningful trip for all of us, but in particular for Isabel and Charlotte, um, who just are super inspirational people, regardless of their rare disease connections. And so um, very fortunate that Elsevier sort of backed us in doing this, and uh, we were able to carry their flag up for Year of the Zebra just a couple of weeks ago. Well, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Dr. David Fagenbaum. Um, yeah, he was a great, great interview. What I took away from that, not only learning about rare disease, but learning about the collaborative network where he was able to really crowdsource people from around the world to help identify 
a solution for his Castleman's disease. And ironically, you know, the cure was in a common drug at CVS just a couple blocks down the road from where he lived. And and this disease was a serious, serious undertaking for his life. I mean, he was near death several times. But this whole idea of having a collaborative network, being able to accelerate the research and treatment and educate people, get them involved in the community, I think that's got to be a key element of the whole rare disease movement, if you will. And and he mentioned that some drugs basically that are approved by the FDA already, like, for example, Viagra, you know, uh, we know what it was used for initially, but it's actually it, it treats a, a, a pulmonary hypertension, lung disease and flaminamide, which, you know, caused birth defects. It's actually used uh, um, as an anti-cancer for multiple myeloma. Do you see that being part of your initiative, getting this collaborative network type thing going to help find more of these um, therapies and and treatments? 100%. Um, So I'm an advisor to David's uh, group, Every Cure, and we had him speak at our Elsevier One Health kickoff a couple of weeks ago, where he spoke very articulately, not only about his story, but the fact that there are 3,000 drugs that humans have created in our history. But as I mentioned, there's over 7,000 rare diseases and disease conditions. And so his whole thing and and many other groups have been working on this too, like Beacon, which is a a, a UK-based charity that we work with and donate to, uh, repurposing drugs is like a key part. And part of the issue is, one, we don't, we just, we need more patients in it and more clinical trials to, to do this work. So there's, there's a funding issue with it, but there's also just getting enough patients together because when you have someone who has a one in a million disease, right, that's only, you know, a handful of people in any given country who have that 300 people in the US and, you know, less than other, other smaller countries. So you have to be able to bring them together through the collaborative network, as you mentioned. Uh, and fortunately, again, part of why I think Elsevier is the most well positioned company to help with this stuff and has been is because we also have an entire division with, you know, all not only the science, science research publications where you can crawl what what drugs have worked where case studies, case reports, etc. But also, there's products like Pharmapendium that we have that are able, which we're providing access to David and others to, that you can interrogate drug targets and do some you know, AI-driven work to find what potential candidates could work for various conditions. Not just the rare conditions again, but but also like they use these tools to help identify what drugs could work for COVID, uh, which wound up being totally in silico, which means they didn't have to do any clinical trials. They wound up doing them, but uh, they just sort of hypothesized based on the structure of COVID which drugs could work based on our data sets. And that was very effective at identifying that. And that's only going to get better with with uh, the developments in artificial intelligence um, and data science. So, Shiv, let's talk about your podcast. I reviewed it the other day, and I got so excited. I felt like I was opening up a holiday present list. I looked at <laughs> all the stuff out there, 300 and some, 300 plus interviews, conversations, you know, on the Business of Healthcare podcast, I think this will be number 108 with you. So I, I looked down the list and, and some of the people you've talked to, we've talked to as well, Vivian Lee, The Long Fix, and uh, Gordon Chin with Chin Med. Uh, you mentioned David Fakenbaum, Marty McCary, The Price We Pay. All those are really great stories. Tell me more about Raise the Line. How did you come up with that? And you've got an incredible producer team behind that. Share more with the audience. I'd like for them all to know about it and go to your uh, your 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 podcast link as well. Totally. Yeah, we, we're really fortunate to have a wonderful team led by my co-host and co-producer, producer Michael Carice, who was at NPR before and, and ran communications at the University of Vermont, and Michelle Zeiser, who does all the bookings as well. Uh, essentially, you know, remember, take us back to March 2020 right when uh, COVID was starting to really uh, expand here in the US. And everyone was talking about this term flatten the curve, right? So let's take that epidemiological curve and flatten it. um, So we don't overwhelm the health system. So stay at home, wear a mask, uh, and uh, basically don't overwhelm the system, like don't don't buy ventilators, I mean, make sure the hospitals have ventilators, etc. The other piece, though, from flattening the curve is how do we strengthen the healthcare system? How do we have more people trained in critical care? How do we have more uh, telehealth, more ventilators, more physicians, et cetera? So that's raising the line. So we came up with that concept very early on, where flattening the curve is one half, raising the line is the other half. And you don't just raise the line for COVID, you also raise the line for diabetes. You raise the line for um, uh, general preventative medicine. And so that's what osmosis and Elsevier have been doing for, in our case, a decade of osmosis, in Elsevier's case, over a century, which is how do you train more healthcare providers and keep them in the 
field for longer. So all the guests, and we have a wide variety, as you mentioned, healthcare leaders, uh, we have retail pharmacy leaders, we have um, authors, so some celebrities, et cetera, people like Ariana Huffington and Mark Cuban we've had, just talking about ideas that they have post-pandemic for improving our healthcare systems. And uh, it's been a wonderful project to work on, a labor of love. But one of my favorite questions we often ask on these podcasts is what advice would you give to our early stage career professionals about meeting their challenges? And that, that I think, is a treasure trove where at one point, I think we're going to combine all of that advice from those hundreds of guests and turn it into like some sort of essay or, or blog or video, um, uh, which I think would be pretty inspirational to, to people listening. Well, we have a lot in common, uh, Shiv. Here at the university, we're trying to eliminate the sage on the stage. You know, we try to do things that are highly interactive, case-based. We're really trying to address some of the pressing issues that that you are, the same type of issues that you're trying to communicate for the next generation of healthcare leadership. Content creation, your strategy for getting new content, how do you go about soliciting that? For for the podcast or for the for osmosis in for general? For osmosis, for osmosis primarily. Yeah, totally. So we have a, a process where we look at the most common searches. Uh, you know, we, we take, we, we really put ourselves in our customer's shoes. Literally, again, we started this because we were customers solving our own problem of learning medicine, making it more enjoyable and more, more engaging and effective. Um, and so we track what people are searching for that may or may not have pages on it. And that, that sort of is rank ordered every month and we decide what to produce. That's one approach. Another approach is we tackle different fields and different um, specialties at different times. So, for example, you know, we're doing a huge uh, clinical practice push this year where the transition from third and fourth year of med school in the U.S., the, the later stage of clinical medicine to residency, we need to train more practice ready clinicians and, and help save them time and make them more effective. Um, and that's not just through video and question content, but through some of the Elsevier products like clinical cases uh, 3D simulations, patient experiences, et cetera. So that's another way we look at it is what, what, what does the group actually need and what aligns with the curriculum? Um, and then the third way, we have a, a wonderful team at Osmosis called Diffusion Studios that's worked with the FDA, with the CDC, with YouTube, 23andMe, and a bunch of other organizations who then will, you know, we developed courses for. So 23andMe approached us and wanted to develop a course training. There's only 5,000 genetic counselors in the US. And genetics, as you know, through programs like 23andMe, but also Illumina now has a under $200 whole genome product, which is amazing. We're getting that cost of $100 to get your whole genome sequence. This means there's going to be a huge amount of people, and there already is, who are interested in knowing more about their genetic information. So we have to educate patients, but also general healthcare providers, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, primary care physicians on genetics. So with 23andMe, we made an entire course on uh, direct-to-consumer genetics, what happens if a patient brings in like a 23andMe or other direct-to-consumer result. Uh, and so that's another way we we do work is, you know, anyone who wants to create a course on something with LifeBridge Health, we made some on radiology. Um, we also uh, partner with groups to, to do that kind of work. Well, I'd like to say this. Um, this has been a great opportunity to share Rare Disease Day with you, Shiv. I'm I'm delighted to discover more. I am so glad to have found osmosis.org and raise the line. I'm going to encourage all of our our listeners to to go to those two locations to learn more. You know, we have a lot in common. Um, you know, you're from sub-Saharan Africa. I did my deep DNA research and 50,000 years ago my family came from there too. So <laughs> I'm I'm Ethiopian. Brothers. Um, <laughs> brothers all the way back back the line there. Great time to be with you today. I want to thank you for your time um, and all that you're doing. This is really exciting. The whole education world that we're in, it's got a big challenge in front of it. And with our efforts, we'll be able to help bring a little bit more light to it. So thank you. Bob, thanks so much for having me on. I'm a huge fan of what you're doing and look forward to connecting. And I encourage your audience, if they're interested in any of this stuff, to add me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Shiv Biglani on LinkedIn, as far as I know. So appreciate, uh, again, giving me the opportunity to talk about this stuff. Okay, good. Thanks for listening to the Business of Healthcare podcast. To learn more about the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, go to jindal.utdallas.edu slash healthcare. Mm -hmm.